Let's start at uh, Lexus, are you there? <clears throat> Let's start slide five and yeah. go from there. Um, slide five. Okay, agenda, blah, blah. Uh, Harbor, uh, now Harbor is in the sandbox now. Thank you very much to Harbor team for that. Should we be seeing the presentation, Alexis? I'm not seeing it. Maybe it's just me. Uh, sure, we could share. Um, let's see, Taylor, do you want to share and drive? Yeah, that would be great. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No worries. Give it a, uh, give it a second. See, if I could interrupt as well, uh, we normally skip past the agenda slide, but could I just call out when everyone's here on slide five that a deadline this Sunday, um, August 12th, for KubeCon Cloud Native Con Seattle. So we're expecting six to 7,000 people at this. Please, uh, this is the week to submit and get uh, your colleagues in your company or organization to submit. Hey. All right, someone needs to be muted, cool. All right, go, go, uh, go for it, Alexis. All right, thanks. So we've got Harbor has come in. Welcome, Harbor. And thank you for everybody who worked on that. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, just, just to interrupt on Harbor, uh, I didn't see a vote for that. Did I miss something? It's Sandbox. Yep, Sandbox got two sponsors. Oh, so we don't vote on them. OK, cool. <laughs> no worries. Uh, the PR was there, so. But this, this one does have a vote. Uh, congratulations to Prometheus. That is, uh, our, I believe, second graduated project um, uh, after a long journey in incubation and uh, quite a bit of effort by everybody to get this thing into good shape, uh, making sure that the graduation process is very meaningful indeed. Uh, this was something that we voted on. There was quite a lot of consideration taken around, around the project. One thing that you'll be hearing about a bit more is open metrics, which came out of Prometheus originally. Uh, but it's not a Prometheus specific project. It's a way of uh, sharing the format for the metrics more widely so that other um, teams and protocols, sorry, other projects can use it like Open Census, for example. Okay. Right, we've got more things coming along. And um, so, project reviews, Brian Cantrell, have you managed to speak to the uh, Codex people? Yeah, I'm sorry I haven't, and I've been on vacation for the last two weeks, and I'm, I'm going to be out for the rest of this week, but then I will be back so um, and with a clearer schedule. So I'm sorry that this has just been a brutal couple of weeks with me being out most, for most of it. Great, thank you. Um, the next one is TIKV, which I think has its sponsors. Uh, Rook. Uh, what is the TOC feedback, Chris, that we need to uh, so so the, the Rook folks are going to uh, are asking to move from Sandbox to Incubation, and we'll do a small presentation the next uh, meeting. Uh, you could take a look at the pull request where they detail um, them fulfilling the criteria and are requesting for feedback uh, there, so. Okay. And then more importantly, there is uh, three projects uh, that have requested to present. Um, this is something Brian Grant kind of requested that we cover over TOC calls before we decide to allow them to present or not. So we have Strimzy, Habitus, and WeaveNet. We necessarily don't have to make that decision today, uh, but um, I'm pointing them out uh, here for you to consider. Okay, I'm surprised to see that the WeaveNet guys put that in for the sandbox. That's probably a mistake. That should be incubation. Or uh, it could be my fault or reading it, but I'll hold it. Okay, did you see anything submitted on WeaveScope, uh, Chris, at all? Nope. They expect that to backlog is there. Okay, and we've got a couple of presentations today as well. So, okay. are there dates assigned to those uh, backlog items? Uh, the, the the dates, everything in backlog is scheduled to present. Uh, everything in request to present is not scheduled, and requesting uh, TOC feedback to either allow them or pass. Okay, so the dates are in the spreadsheet or uh, the dates are on the github repo if you go to github.com slash cncf slash toc you'll see them scheduled I'll, i could I add the i could add the dates okay. uh, for the next toc meeting too they're just in the readme yep okay thanks okay uh all right next slide please 
So this is a quick readout from me on the governing board meeting. Um, I'll try and keep this fairly short because we've got some presentations today. Uh, we can follow up on the, on the, on the public TOC list uh, if people want to discuss any of this. Can you go to the next slide, please, Taylor? So one of the things that came through strongly in the request for feedback from TOC was that we want to build stronger bridges with the end user community now that it's becoming bigger. Uh, these are some of the things that we asked for. Uh, there, was, there was a good response from the GB on this request uh, that it was re read very much as a, a sort of set of requirements for how the GB and the end user group could, could kind of go away and come up with ways of interacting with the TOC. So what, what, what we're not presenting here is a solution, more of a uh, question to the GB and to the end user group. How can you help us to find out more about the projects? Um, okay. Okay, next slide. Uh, we had some talk, especially kind of in the water cooler moments as well, around the future growth of the CNCF and the importance of retaining a high level of clarity around the, what we're doing, why we're doing it, what projects are for and how they fit together. So, um, you know, I have personally expressed the concern that the, the landscape um, is still being, you know, sometimes presented in its in all of its true glory, consisting of everything that might have something to do with cloud native. And here's a link to some commentary on, on Twitter from, from the notorious Simon talking about that. And then, um, you know, Dan pointed out that we have the trail map, which is getting good traction as more of a opinionated guide that actually refers to the projects in the CNCF. I think it's very, very important that we, that we continue to give people opinion uh, around um, what we're doing and don't get too sprawly. So we talked about some of the potential threats there, including that as Kubernetes gets more and more popular, uh, there is a potential of having X for Kubernetes for really any value of X. Um, for example, I mentioned the project Cortex, which I'm close to because it came out of Weave. You know, that's a splicing between the Prometheus and Kubernetes. So where do you, what, how do you deal with all of those things? So uh, on the next slide, please, here is a proposal. So this is not a formal proposal at this point, but it's something that I thought we could discuss uh, as, as the year goes by. The idea here is to form categories uh, within the CNCF of um, clumps of related activity, um, e.g. security or observability. And, and Brian Grant also pointed out that we could encourage some, some of the projects to think of themselves more as a platform a sort of something which has a constellation of smaller projects around it. Uh, there's also the potential to have verticalization uh, in the future. And um, there's also different classes of project like etcd. You know, we've, we've previously talked in the TOC about the importance of etcd coming in and being a, a stable stability first component rather than trying to express great velocity. Some of the things that might be uh, provided by, by different categories would be white papers, uh, a category specific landscape, for example, the security landscape or the serverless landscape that we've already seen in the serverless working group, uh, more patterns that are focused, um, reference architectures around the category and obviously working groups. This would also give us a mechanism for um, migrating the working group model to something that I think has a bit more long-term value. So um, I'll open the floor for a few minutes to this. Does anyone else, apart from Ducey, who's commented on uh, I am there. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Want to comment on this? It's just an idea. So, what do you think? Uh, seems very reasonable to me. We we need some form of hierarchy. Otherwise, a, a flat structure of everything is just not reasonably na navigable by human beings. What I think what ends up happening is you end up missing parts and then things aren't categorized in the right way. And I think the end user doesn't understand how you end up using some projects as well. So this would provide that clarity. Yeah, I think um, it's worth working on uh, this further to see if we can come up with a more concrete proposal you know, in some areas, there will be high degree of affinity between 
the solar system model and the categories um, like monitoring and Prometheus related things, for example. In other cases, there may not be that much alignment between those approaches, uh, like Kubernetes, as you said, and pretty much anything. Um, so we might want to play with that a little bit and see if one or the other helps more or if we need some flavor of both approaches. But I, I definitely think something or multiple somethings in this area is going to be needed as the foundation grows. Yeah. Yeah, I think something like this, especially if um, we have a proliferation of new functionality on top of Kubernetes, I think that's going to present all kinds of challenges, which we've managed so far to shy away from, which I'm quite glad about, but I'm not sure if that's something we can postpone indefinitely. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion about this at the GB. I should also add that I think this um, category proposal in its very raw form was, was well received by the GB. But I do agree, we should flesh it out more. Um, what is a good way to flesh this out more? Or should we do the classic build a document like we did with the sandbox? I actually think um, taking the existing projects and uh, some of the perspective ones from the uh, from the upcoming uh, presentations and also from the landscape or just other projects that we know about, not that they necessarily would come into the CNCF, but just say, well, if we took this set of 50 projects and we applied this approach, this is what it would look like. I think that would, you know, having some concrete examples would help a lot. Yeah, it's, it sounds like something that a working group might want to tackle. Uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of like making a big working group or whatever. I would just say we should get three volunteers or something to actually go mock up some proposals. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, let's create a mailing list and get a few volunteers to just hammer away at this. Hey, Chris, yeah. um, I like oh. this is Ken. So um, hey. uh, on the, we've been kind of looking at this in the reference architecture working group. And so um, definitely happy to take that into that discussion and others can join and lead that if they want to drive that. Yeah, yeah that, could, I mean, that could be easier. Come back with a list of potential categories and um, which current projects we have, which would map into those and which ones are in the pipeline and just start from there and then maybe identify one or two using the model that Brian described. Okay. Yeah, let's do yeah. that. And the objective here, Alexis, is to offer clarity, correct? I mean, that's the overall objective is to allow people to, to, to make sense of the landscape. I think um, to make, even, even if you consider the landscape to consist only of the projects that are current, that are actually in the CNCF, um, then I think the number will be growing. And uh, we're really at a point now where it's going to get uh, if it gets much bigger, it will become very confusing. So, no, no, yes. I understand that, but I understand that, but I, I just want to make sure that we keep that that objective in mind because I think what we don't want to do is end up in endless adjudication over ta taxonomizing a project in in one spot or another um, because it that there's a perception that to be ta taxonomized one way means one thing and another thing means another way means another thing. I think we want to make sure that the emphasis is on clarity. This is not a value judgment that we're really trying. And I, ideally you want to have a taxonomy that allows projects to effectively taxonomize themselves um, in, yeah. in a, a way that is accurate. Because so what we don't want to do, and I've, I mean, I've already seen us do it a lot is where we end up in, in, a, in a lot of adjudication um, for these fine, uh, distinctions that don't necessarily have a difference. Indeed. I, I agree with you, Brian. I was going to make a similar comment. I, I would actually suggest before we try and taxonomize anything, uh, we, we should actually write a very brief, you know, I'm thinking half page thing, just making very clear what the goals are and then very clear what, you know, there, there may well be more than one proposed taxonomy. I can imagine one by area and one by uh, you know, anchor project or something, and maybe a combination of those, and just just write those down and be very clear what they are and what the goals are, 
uh, before we start arguing about whether this taxonomy is better than that one. Yeah, and I think we want to stray away from things like momentum and maturity, and I mean, we, we, we want to stray away from those kinds of attributes and really stick, I think, stick to those attributes which are going to allow for, for greatest clarity um, for those people who are trying to use these projects to understand them. Right. Okay, so uh, Chris is suggesting that we continue the discussion in the CNCF dash reference architecture uh, working uh, sorry list. Um, I take it everyone is able to access that. You should sign up for it if you haven't already. Tell Ken. So Ken, will you come back for the next TOC meeting with a list of potential categories from the architecture? Maybe even present the current working architecture V two at the same time. And you might be on mute. Yeah, I, I think that's a perfect, perfect thing to come back with in two weeks. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, this is a recurring theme. I brought up this with the GB as well. You know, the um, it's really, really important for the CNCF to add value to projects. I know there's many other things that we care about. This for me is very important that if the projects are happy, then other things will follow. Uh, we had the discussion about the trademark thing that uh, that came up around O'Reilly, and that's in you know a solution I hope is in progress. Um, and uh, yeah, that's there's not much else to say about this slide, so let's move on. And this is something that a slide that I showed in uh, Copenhagen. I mean, maybe you know another thing we could do off the back of categories is have some kind of dare I say it roadmap. Um, this this particular table was. Um, completely of my own creation, and I emphasized that point when I presented it, but it would be nice maybe to have something with a more collective view um, in the future. But I think categories first. All right, next slide, please. Okay, now it's time for the etcd folks to present etcd, um, which I'm sure we've all heard of. Who's there to talk about that? Uh, yeah, here, I'm Guho from AWS. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, let's start. So I'm talk I'm gonna talk about SCD, like how it's built internally, like the architecture things. And then I this is going to be very high level, like for like only in like a 15 minutes. And then please ask any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. So next slide, please. So SCD is consistent distributed key value store, mainly used as a coordination, separate coordination service in distributed systems designed to hold small amount of data, like that can fit entirely in memory. Although we still write to disk for durability. So you don't want to store like all of your applications data in SCD. And it is quite popular, like Kubernetes relies on it. And then we also have a lot of non-Kubernetes use cases. Uh, NTT from Japan uses SCD to manage their network infrastructure. And then also Uber is using SCD to manage their uh, M3 time series database. And then also recently Brain, Braintree uh, replaced Redis to power their caching systems. Uh, okay, and then next slide. So this is how SCD works in terms of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes control plane interact with SCD. For instance, Kubernetes API server persist or cluster metadata in SCD. And then the kubelet or node agent can subscribe to this information through SCD. And whenever changes happen in SCD, SCD notifies the client, which is Kubernetes API server, so that it can keep the data up to date. And next slide, please. And the SCD is distributed for high availability while we prioritize consistency and then partition tolerance. What that means, SCD provides one logical cluster view of many physical servers. So long as the quorum is up, SCD continues to work even under machine failures. So this redundancy provides us with fault tolerance. Next slide. So SCD, yeah, this is our uh, API. So SCD has a flat binary key space with no directory hierarchy. So SCD uses ranges to search for keys in an interval. So this interval model support calling keys on prefixes as if from a directory. 
and then SCD list is not tied to any session or connection, you can create like, as many lists as you want. Instead of, of key having a TTL or list, with TTL is attached to the key. And then when the list expires, all associated keys in SCD storage are deleted. Also, this model reduces people like traffic. Like, let's say multiple keys are associated with the same list object. And then when people like requests are multiplexed over a single gRPC stream, like we can like make the stream like the multiplexing and stream like the broadcasting more like efficient. And in addition, they are also processed by the leader, like without going through the raft layer. So we don't have any like the overhead, like consensus overhead when we when we have an idling like list like request. And then SCD can also serialize multiple operations into single conditional mini transaction. So each transaction include a conjunction of conditional like guard. So we can check, we can do checks on key version and the modified revision or like value of the key. And then we also have a list operations to apply when all the conditions to evaluate, evaluate to true. And then we have a list of operations to apply if any of the conditions evaluate to false. And then this transaction make our distributed locks safe because access can be conditional based on whether the client still holding its lock. This means, this means that like SCD server like reject the, the lock, like election API when the client like is lose, losing its claim on a lock. So that can happen like due to like client error or like missing exploration event. So next slide. So we have a streaming RPC for watch or like list keep alive. So like Zookeeper or console or SCD version two like can only return one event per watch request. And then they require long polling over HTTP and then forcing the systems basically hold open a TCP connection per watch request. But let's say you have a uh, thousands of watch client then like, we can quickly use up all the server socket and the memory resources. So SCD version three, like instead of opening a new connection per watch request, we register one watcher on a shared bi-directional gRPC stream. And then like this stream delivers event tagged with a watcher ID. So that is like what multiple watch streams can share the same TCP connection. And then this streaming multiplexing like reduce like SCD memory footprint by at least on order of magnitude. Next slide. So SCD is distributed. So we need replication protocol, like which is Raft. So SCD server implement the Raft consensus algorithm. So it is leader based. Leader is chosen by the followers and then followers forward proposal to the leader. And then the leader controls like everything, like leaders controls to what to commit or not. And this leader must receive the acknowledgement from quorum of the cluster to make any progress. So these safety guarantees of Raft provide consistency and then partition tolerance. And then the client doesn't need to reason about cluster membership, like which means client request just like automatically forwarded to leader node. And then, yeah, SCD has the most widely used uh, Raft implementation. So Cockroach DB and then TIKB and then many other like project rely on it. And then they also contribute back to SCD, yeah, which is great. And then it is very stable and then reliable. Next slide, please. So SCD write distributed consistent log over Raft for, for durability. And then this underlying storage layer is write ahead log, like wall. So let's say client send a write request to the SCD server, and then this proposal first goes to leader. And then uh, when the proposal has been agreed by the quorum of cluster, like leader commits that entry. And then when we commit, we append that entry to the wall file. And then this committed log entry is persistent. And then when we say persistent, it means F sync down to the disk, like which like gives durability. And then if this machine crash, like 
we can just restart the server and then the server can just replay the logs back from disk. And then in order to avoid running out of disk space, we break this into small files, like periodically purging the old ones. So for, and then for performance, like each segment file is pre-allocated 64 megabytes. So there, we don't have any latency for metadata update or allocating blocks. And then buffering is also special, like in that like writer flushes only on full sector write, or like when explicitly asked. And then SCD flushes wall logs to disk for every four kilobytes. And then also for consistency, we keep rolling CRC and then also safe against the write hairs. So smallest write unit to single record is raft entry or a raft hard state. And then this each record follows like eight byte data alignment. So let's say one disk sector is five, 12 byte, and then world record is uh, 1022 byte. Then the, the wall, like our wall encoder add like two padding bytes at the end to make this like fully sector aligned. So assuming that like sector disk write is uh, all or nothing, so writer would never straddle like on record across disk sectors. So yeah, this is how we prevent write tears and then partial like write. Next slide, please. So SCD has a separate backend database because like wall is only for appending raft entries in binary format. So we need a like nice, nice layer on top in order to represent like actual key value data. So SCD version two only keeps the most recent key value mappings and discarding the older versions. However, uh, yeah, this is not good because like the watch client may miss the discarded event from brief network disconnections. So to avoid this unpredictable window, SCD version three API retains the historical key revisions through multi-version concurrency control model. So this uh, retention policy for this history that like, can be configured. So I know Kubernetes uh, use one hour and then typical SCD cluster retains the, the superseded key data for hours. And then to reliably handle longer client disconnection, not just transient like network disruptions, SCD version three what what API can simply resume from the last observed like historical revision. And then the SCD backend database has two components, like one is uh, in memory B minus three, and then the other is B plus on disk database, which is both DB. And then uh, each write increment modified revision as a global counter. And then in memory B minus three index this, like each key to this revision. And then each node is uniquely identified by the key and then contains historical revisions. On disk B plus three stores the modified revision as a key and then the key value data as a value on B plus three. Next slide, please. So we spend as much time to implement fault tolerant client. So what that means when there is a transient disconnect or network partition, uh, we expect client to automatically fail over like or do more efficient retries using, so like our client using uh, gRPC health checking protocol and then HTTP to ping. So, and then uh, this is extremely important. And then at the same time, it's really hard to get it right. So last year we spent like several months to implement this feature. And then we, also, we even backported that like huge feature to SCD version 3.2 for Kubernetes users. And then you can read more about this in, the, in our docs, the slide. And then, yeah, for just to review the whole data flow. So we have a client talk to SCD servers using gRPC and then gRPC calls can be either unary like or streaming RPC. And then server front end handles the transport to talk to other peers and then implement the quota layer to put the cluster into maintenance mode. Like when like the data exceed the database size limit or like when it finds the data corruption. And then MVCC layer, like implement the multi-version concurrency control and to retain the historical data and then also implement the watch storage. And then both DB is an embedded key value storage engine that SCD uses to persist this data on disk. And then raft layer to handle the log replication. And then we have a wall storage to persist raft log, log entries on disk. Next slide. 
So yeah, we get contribution from, from all over the world. Like core maintenance are very well distributed. Myself work for AWS. And then I think Xiang Li is, is also here. So he's the creator of SCD, now work for Alibaba Cloud. And then we have a Joe Batch from Google Cloud Kubernetes team. And then also a lot of maintainers from Red Hat. And then we want to have more consistent maintainers, like which is why we want to donate SCD to CNCF. And then we also, we track all the user issues on GitHub. And then we have a bi-weekly community meetings to discuss any outstanding SCD issues and then share development, development progress. For engineering side, we spent a lot of time for testing. Like SCD has very limited set of features. So reliability is our highest priority. So yeah, SCD functional testing verifies the correct behavior of SCD under like simulated system failures and then faulty network. And uh, it's set up uh, on SCD cluster under high pressure load and then continuously inject failures into the cluster and then expecting the SCD cluster to recover within a few seconds. Yeah, this has been like extremely helpful to find, for us to find critical bugs. And then, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so this is the roadmap. So in the meantime, yeah, we want SCD to be better integrated with both upstream and then downstream. So such as gRPC and Kubernetes. And then, yeah, so and then we also planning to add non-voting member support. Like currently SCD uh, and member add operation can be quite disruptive. So let's say when a new member comes in to the cluster, and then SCD leader has to replicate all the logs from beginning or send snapshot to the new member. So this is already a lot of work for like SCD leader node. And then this is even worse if the new member partitioned were being slow. It can affect the cluster availabilities. So once we have the non-voting member feature, we, or we call like raft learner, as an additional state in raft implementation, like this new member joins the cluster as a non-voting member, like before disruptive configuration changes happen. And then, yeah, in that case, the leader still re replicate the logs to this like learner node, but it, it is not yet counted towards the, our like quorum. So once this new server has caught up, and it can like promote it as a like regular node and then count it as a Chrome. But while the learner node is catching up, SCD does not need to wait on the like a new fresh node for cluster-wide consensus. So this is one of our feature we want to add in the next uh, release cycle. And uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so we uh, yeah, so we want to propose SCD as a CNCF project. So I, I believe like CNCF can benefit SCD for a lot of things. So right now we have a shared Google Cloud account for our release process and then also for testing. So we have been using this cluster, I mean, have, we have been using this account since the early days of CoreOS, but now uh, it is not clear who gets to pay the, pay the bills since like team is like distributed across different companies. And then hopefully we can get the better CI support. Right now we use CI uh, free like CI service. And then once we grow the project, we may need more resources, like more computing power. So we might need like dedicated Jenkins in the cluster, something like that. And then more important with CNCF, we want to grow SCD communities and then hopefully more consistent contributors and maintainers. Yeah, that's it. Cool, <laughs> thank you. Uh, any questions for uh, the etcd community? I believe Brian Grant, you're sponsoring this one. Yes. Yeah, any questions? So I think uh, SCD is good for incubating project. Like, what do you think? I'm not sure. Uh, it definitely think, has a lot of yeah. usage. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy to co-sponsor that at incubation level. This is Quentin. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Chris, can you follow up and help uh, the etcd team understand about the yeah. documentation process for incubation applications? Yep, yeah, will do, no problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good presentation, thanks. Good point, Bob. Okay, and I think it's the R socket folks next. 
Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Taylor? Now, before we go on, I'd like to mention that I'm uh, extremely keen to sponsor this project. I spent a long time doing some uh, DD with Ben Hale, who I see is on the call, and um, the team from Facebook who co-developed it with Pivotal. Um, as with Nats, there is going to be uh, an, probably an initial uh, set of uh, questions around where exactly does this fit into the landscape. So please be patient um, with the RSocket folks. I personally believe there is a really good use case for this. Okay, so who wants to go first, Ben or anyone else going to take, take us through this? This is Ben. Can you hear me this morning? Yeah. Great. Uh, so my name is Ben Hale. I'm here. Um, I'm a longtime Spring member and a Pivotal employee. Uh, I have with me Robert Roser, um, formerly of Netflix uh, and now at a startup called Netify. And we also have on the phone um, Steve Gurry, formerly of Netflix, now at Facebook. So next slide, please. Um, so the the R socket um, project uh, came about um, out of efforts out of Netflix to sort of think about what network protocols mean in the concept of microservices. And coincidentally, in the last uh, year or so, the the Spring team has been really heavily looking at um, reactive programming generally, but more importantly, what it means um, in the Java world to start doing microservices beyond just sort of your first or second microservice. And while we've been a big fan of sort of the, the reactive streams, pull push, um, back pressure programming model, we also have observed that when it sort of starts to leave the JVM, we run into some problems, whether it's connecting with a database or making some sort of network connection to something else, the, the benefits of this pull push back pressure model get lost. All of a sudden you have things pushing data a bit faster than the consumer can handle it, or the consumer um, is, is misbehaving in some way that, the, that isn't being communicated back to the publisher. And so we, we sort of coincidentally started looking at what protocols might be available to us, what improvements we could make to sort of take this programming model that we truly believe in and take it across the wire. Um, at the same time, uh, some of the staff from Netflix start, or sorry, from uh, Facebook started reaching out to us and said, hey, we've got this protocol that we're using internally quite a bit. Is this something that Spring Team would like to be involved with? And we said, absolutely, yes. Because when we talk about the RSocket protocol, we're talking about uh, a, a protocol that answers a lot of questions that we see currently in modern day microservice design. So it's a, it's a protocol that's message driven primarily rather than being um, uh, straight RPC. It's asynchronous and it's multiplexed. You know, it sort of hits a lot of the high points that straight HTTP doesn't um, uh, solve straight out of the bat. Um, one of the other sort of side advantages that we've been a real fan of and we're starting to see more and more inside of um, our customer projects is there's browser support for this protocol. And we'll talk a little bit um, later on about how this is achieved in sort of standard networks as well. As I said before, it supports these reactive principles from the reactive manifesto. Next slide, please. So one of the key things about the R socket protocol is it encapsulates some discrete interaction models rather than being really, really generic and saying, build it yourself. There's this idea that um, we've identified four discrete interaction models that sort of encapsulate what we see most of our customers trying to do. So the first one we call fire and forget. And this is effectively where one side of the connection can send a message to the other side of the connection and it doesn't really have to wait for any sort of confirmation or response from the other side. We're just gonna do our best effort delivery. Lossiness might be tolerable, so you might see this as uh, diagnostic logs or something like that, or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, stuff that isn't absolutely critical. We also have standard request response that you're familiar with from something like HTTP, where you send a request and you expect some sort of confirmation to come back. Maybe there's payload, maybe there's not, but you do get a positive um, interaction from the side uh, receiving the message that the, the message has been received successfully. We also encapsulate the idea of a request stream. So a single request may respond with multiple streamed responses, but going back to the, the concept of reactive programming, this, this stream of responses comes only at a rate that the consumer can safely consume these things. So you don't end up with something like um, a huge amount of data generated on the server side, either cache there or forced across the wire as quickly as possible and overwhelming a slow network connection or a slow device sitting on the other end of it. 
And then finally, um, the, uh, an interaction model where anything goes. It's basically a bi-directional um, full duplex channel where messages can be passed from either side of the channel back and forth at will uh, with responses coming as necessary from the other end. So we wanted to make one of the key tenets of our socket is that every, we believe that um, all, if or most, if not all, uh, interaction um, between microservices uh, can be encapsulated with these four things, and we have first-class support for doing this kind of work. Next slide, please. So as I said, um, the, the connection or the protocol itself is bi-directional, which basically means as soon as a connection is established, so there is kind of the concept of a client and a server to establish a connection, but once the, 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 uh, the pipe is, is connected between two entities, um, either side can then start those interaction models that we saw. So there isn't one side that is sort of disadvantaged to the other. They become equal members of the network once the connection has been established. We also have the, the idea of cancellation. So one of the, the big downsides to HTTP as it exists today is this idea that uh, once a connection or once a request has been made to the server, you effectively have no influence on what happens. You can drop the connection completely potentially, which could be expensive or not expensive depending on um, the circumstances you're in, but the server is going to attempt to do a potentially very large amount of work and you have no interaction and no influence on whether or not that actually needs to get done by the end. So our socket builds in this concept, excuse me, of cancellation uh, into the protocol itself, potentially short circuiting very expensive operations if they become unnecessary as time goes on. Another really, really important feature um, that's been proven out quite nicely inside of Facebook is this idea of resumability. So there's uh, uh, inside of an R socket connection, um, state can be maintained uh, as to sort of a given session, the data that has been transferred across that session and successfully received by um, the other side. And this becomes really, really useful in a protocol because it means say, if you're trying to transmit data from a data center into a mobile device or something, and that person on that mobile device is walking around on the street, but eventually walks into a Starbucks and flips over to Wi-Fi technically the network connection has been dropped. And if you had to enumerate all of the previous set of data um, in order to, uh, or sorry, enumerate a, a fixed state of data so that you could then start taking updates from it, it becomes very expensive, both from a network perspective and from the server side perspective to sort of regenerate the state where things were. Uh, the protocol itself supports this idea and implementations are free to choose how exactly this works. This idea that um, you have a session and even if there has been a network interruption, you can then resume that session where you were and you're only responsible for any messages that had been uh, sent since the last message you had um, that, that had been successfully uh, consumed. We have the idea of application flow control, both between um, two connected peers. So there's this idea of back pressure saying that only a certain amount of data that can be consumed by, the, by one end can be sent by the publishing end. But there's also the idea of leasing, which is effectively a load balancing concept that makes it so that clients can't overwhelm servers as well. They, they are um, uh, handed out uh, fixed numbers of requests that they are allowed to maintain, uh, sort of giving a client side load balancing kind of behavior. And then finally, we also support the idea of fragmentation of individual frames. Uh, as data is sent, especially when it's something that's a large piece of data, say photos or a video or something like that, uh, to help networks, it's very often um, very useful to be able to fragment those payloads. Next slide, please. So, our, those are sort of the features of RSOC, the things that it promises to do for you. But one of the, the key things that really attracted um, the, the Pivotal team is this idea that it's really, really flexible. So we talk about this as a protocol and really it's only uh, a network framing protocol. It's completely transport, transport agnostic. So it can be routed over raw TCP, which we see a lot of people doing. If you only have access to HTTP one, you can do it with web sockets. If you have HTTP two, it builds very nicely on that. And even exotic protocols such as Aeron, UDP protocol, um, can all sort of 
benefit from the R socket layer sitting on top of it. It's also payload agnostic. So we'll probably see a lot of users trying to send proto buffs across R socket, but it's absolutely not required that that be the thing you send. You can send JSON just as easily. Maybe you're um, a, a company that has your own custom binary payload. Because R socket is just a framing protocol, it allows you to put any bag of bytes you want to inside of the payloads that are sent. We also liked that it's very much programming model agnostic. Um, inside the Spring team, we are very big fans of the messaging um, sort of abstraction that you fire off a message and it can be routed to some arbitrary piece of code on the other side based on some routing um, tag attached to it. So we like messaging, but we're fully aware that there's a, a big movement for more RPC style, things like gRPC. And so our socket can support either of those styles depending on which you want. And then finally, uh, and this I think goes for, um, for all of the other companies that are sort of working inside of, uh, inside of the R socket um, project, it's language agnostic. So there are really powerful um, implementations of both Java and C++ with the JavaScript coming on, but we also see them for uh, things like Kotlin and you can um, envision places where something, somebody could implement it with um, uh, Python or you know, uh, Go or something like that. You name your, your favorite language. So if we take a look at the next slide, this is sort of a graphical representation of it. This idea that the R socket protocol is this blue layer in the middle um, that can stack all sorts of different things sitting on top of it and while it builds on various different protocols. And this is one of the ways that we are able to, to support um, browsers as a first class citizen in a protocol like this is it can use um, web sockets or HTTP2 where they're available uh, rather than sort of, you know, some, some TCP based uh, protocol that may not be routed by various proxies and routers. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, there's uh, the next couple of slides are just sort of a comparison between uh, gRPC, NATS, and R socket, which are sort of the uh, closest possible um, uh, competitors or uh, closest possible analogs to something like R socket. And I don't think we need to go through all these. I, we put them in here as reference for you to take a look at them. But um, the, the key thing is that uh, in general, R socket. Um, aims to be this sort of layer in the middle. So a lot of things that you'll see gRPC or NATS potentially do, it will do sort of built in. So whether it's something like cancellations that NATS doesn't have, but gRPC does in a limited way, we can, it's sort of built first class into the protocol. It's a full duplex um, uh, protocol as we described earlier, where once a connection has been established, either side can initiate interactions back and forth. Uh, next slide, please. We have, as we described a little bit before, um, the idea of fire and forget for lossy kind of things. We have resumability built in as a first class citizen. There's flow control based on this reactive streams protocol that's sort of well proven out, especially in the Java world, but starting to, to get to um, alternate locations, or sorry, alternate uh, programming languages as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is sort of encapsulating what we described a little bit before, like the various different language, uh, languages and frameworks that support these things today. And certainly R socket, um, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, R socket has very large strongholds in Java, in the Java world coming from Netflix and Pivotal, but also in the C++ world for um, the, the Facebook team. Hey, uh, Ben, it's slightly irrelevant, but the creator of Nats was actually VMware. And then okay. No, sorry, VMware and then um, Absera, and now it, uh, it's it's Senadia, which is a dedicated company behind that. Behind that. Okay. I'll look at the website. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide, please. So our socket today um, is over 600 GitHub stars between sort of the the big um, projects and in, inside of it that we consider so Java, C++, Kotlin, and the main spec itself. And the contributors, as we said a little bit before, Facebook and Netflix are sort of the, the top level um, uh, high visibility contributors and users of this protocol. Um, but Spring and Project Reactor, our reactive streams implementation uh, inside the team at Protocol, or sorry, at the Pivotal, are very, very big on it as well. It's something that's a, a big tent pole for the next year for us. And then finally, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Netify team, um, former Netflixers who've gone and are working on, um, uh, have built an entire company uh, around this protocol and what it can bring to enterprises. And next slide, please. 
Final slide here. Um, we really would like to get into the CNCF uh, because we do have three very large companies um, currently invested in this very heavily. And one of the, the key things that we observed when we first started uh, uh, con contributing and co collaborating is there is a huge interest in having a neutral third party to do this kind of work. We want to make sure um, that uh, the CNCF is a place where we can all go in. There isn't um, a, a ton of politics going on between the, the three different teams. Not that we, we think there is generally, but it is nice to have that sort of um, neutral third party to, to help with this. So our socket itself is ideal for managing or for connecting microservices themselves. And obviously the CNCF is a great place to start talking about that. A lot of microservice pay, uh, workloads are going to be going on to CNCF projects like Kubernetes and things like that. So we think that this is a great place to sort of start standardizing a protocol that can help um, uh, help those kinds of applications have it close by. We want to expand the RSocket community beyond our sort of Java and C++ strongholds. Obviously, Kubernetes is so polyglot these days. It is a great, a great place for us to get in front of a bunch of different language authors, different uh, microservices authors working in languages beyond our, our sort of traditional core competencies. And we hope that they'll be able to, to see value once we have um, access to them through the CNCF. And finally, we want to integrate with the other CNCF projects um, where we can, because there are a lot of advantages to our socket over something like straight HTTP or even HTTP2. And so we want to make sure that, um, that the, the advantages that our socket actually brings to the table um, can be used by various components inside of the CNCF and inside of sort of the Kubernetes ecosystem. It's not just a one-way street where our socket's getting a lot of help from being in the CNCF. We want to make sure that we give back to the CNCF and make those projects better if we can be. Uh, and that I believe is our final slide. Are there any questions? Who is uh, using our socket? Um, well, right now, the, the biggest user of it is probably Facebook and then uses it Netflix right now. So those are the two big users of it. And then like, I, like Ben said, um, Pivotal is interested in looking at it and then the um, some of the companies that we've been talking to doing some POCs with. But um, for context, the reactive streams in RxJava, RxJava is the number two, number one star Java project on um, GitHub. It's very popular in Android. And like Ben said, one of the big problem for it is once you get to the network, there's this very clunky set of abstractions like circuit breakers and whatnot. And this basically fulfills a huge, huge problem that people held in there. So that's kind of the, the tie-in for the community of people that are interested in it. So if you think of our socket, you also have to kind of include um, the, all the reactive streams users as well. Okay. Hello? Sorry, how large is your community? Do you have um, people from multiple companies contributing or, or volunteers? Um, Pivotal, Facebook, Netflix, um, Netify. So those are certainly the, the big four contributors as they extend now, but I believe, you know, if you counted them out, there's um, a bunch of individual contributors. I know we have um, a fair number of sort of uh, small consultancies in Europe who have done significant contributions both to spec improvements and to um, Java implementation, to the Java implementation as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chris asked, in the chat, um, there is a spec, but what's considered the reference implementation? I'd say um, the reference implementation today is probably the Java one, but the C++ one is also very, very close. Neither of them are 100% spec implemented, um, but we are working very hard, certainly on the Java side, to get there. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. I had a slightly more technical question. so. So many of the, or several of the features, thinking in particular of uh, flow control, um, these kind of things are, are actually provided by the underlying network protocols, uh, TCP, HTTP2, et cetera. Um, could you just speak a little more about how much and why you added more on top of that and didn't just rely on the existing flow control mechanisms? That is a good question. Um, so there's many times in a distributed system where you have plenty of network bandwidth, but in it, but your application receives an expensive call 
right? So let's say you have a, a large payload like a MEG and you can just rip through them all day long and you can use the TCP buffer to stop your system from being overwhelmed. But maybe you have a small size package like one kilobyte that goes off and begins to do a series of very expensive um, operations, right? So by what we do is we actually arbitrage between the network level flow control and the application level flow control. So this actually brings it up to what the application is seeing. So you can begin to go ahead at an application level and prevent very expensive calls coming over the network like that and begin to alleviate the need for um, some of the circuit breaking that people have been putting in place, which is uh, one of the um, reasons that this was began to be designed at uh, Netflix. And then the second thing is the, the flow control of our socket actually is composable between multiple services. So if you had a, a chain of services, the flow control actually will be propagated um, through the chain. So if you had three services, think of A, B, and C, right? And if C is slowing, if C is a slow service, right? But B has plenty of network bandwidth, it can get overwhelmed very quickly, right? But with application level flow control, it can actually propagate up to the caller A to have it slow down and prevent thundering herds. So that's one of the reasons we actually moved up the flow control to the application level as well. And then that ties into the reactive streams um, libraries that are provided at the Java level and there's a C++ version. Hey guys, we're out of time and people uh, just want to say for me, the USPs of this are distributed RX Java, um, good support for streams and in particular, this uh, federated flow control, which I think uh, the use case that you mentioned when we first spoke, but you didn't bring up today is when you've got mobile phones connected to the back end. Yep. Okay, listen, we've got to go. Um, yep. I, I anticipate there are more questions. Please use the public list for more questions and the GitHub issue. Um, and we're obviously looking for someone else from the TOC with a vote to be a sandbox co-sponsor with me. Cool. All right. Thanks all. Thanks, Thank Alexis. You. Bye. All right. Take care all. You too. Thank you.